Finally, I'm going to sort of reflect a little bit on the implications of what we have done and, uh, and sort of plot out a path for the future, but also reflect a little bit on why it took so long to get to where we are now, considering that these drugs have been uh, an enduring feature of human existence for as long as we know. And you've seen several images from Amanda, and I'll just commend you the Greek vase proving that the ancient Greeks used psychedelic ergot set to at least 2,000 years BC. So we know that these drugs have been part of human existence, and there are people who believe they've actually been critical to the evolution of human consciousness and maybe even the human brain, but that's another story. But they've been there, and we sh need to take very conscious uh, notice of the words of this man. So this is William James, arguably the uh, greatest American psychologist, maybe the greatest psychologist, a psychologist, philosopher, a man who used nitrous oxide, uh, who used mescaline uh, to get insights into his brain and his mind and wrote this definitive book on the religious experience called The, the Varieties of Religious Experiences. He was a, a fascinating man who is the, really a pioneer of modern psychology. And he said this, based on his own experience, our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness. Whilst all about it, parted from it by the flimsiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. And this is the key Point. No account of the universe in its totality can be final that leaves these disregarded. How to regard them is the question. And of course, it's been impossible to regard them until we've achieved uh, the modern neuroimaging techniques that we have today. And the other person we should remember and reflect on is Aldous Huxley. And his stepbrother was once president of this organization, the Royal Society, uh, although I'm not sure they ever gave the uh, same accolade. They certainly didn't give a, a fellowship to Aldous. Uh, but Aldous was in many ways the more influential thinker. And after taking mescaline, and he wrote his famous book, The Doors of Perception, and he decided the best quote he could find to explain the experience was this one from the English uh, artist and mystic William Blake, the man that wrote the words Jerusalem and painted some of our greatest watercolours. And Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. And what Blake was saying was that the way humans perceive the world is very limited. And, of course, he was fortunate. He was able to see the more expansive, the greater creative world that artists presumably require in order to, to be creative and, uh, and visionary. But this analogy, I think, from Huxley is very powerful. And it's even more powerful when we think about people who suffer from depression. For while most of you, when you see this limited world that is, uh, you are allowed to see by your brain, you probably see a world which at now is a bit dark, but in the daytime would be a few trees and you know, a bit of sky and a few clouds. But if you're depressed and you look through the chink in your cavern, you just see the fires of hell and souls burning. Or if you've got OCD, you just see dirt. And if you've got addiction to alcohol, you just see bottles of booze. So when you have mental illness, the direction of your vision is limited even worse to the kind of problems that you really don't want to experience. And Huxley was an extraordinary, insightful person. And he came to the conclusion that the brain is an instrument of controlling the mind. And he's right. And it seems now that the whole process of brain development, which starts from the day you're born and hopefully continues to the day you die, but 
probably begins to fade away a bit as you get into your middle age. The, the, the development of consciousness and of awareness in childhood is all about your brain learning to see what others see and to, and to behave in a way that uh, is predictable and reliable, but necessarily conservative and focused. And the brain controls the mind. And I think what we have seen today from those imaging studies is that under LSD, the brain is less able to control the mind. And the mind can be freer, uh, more creative, more open, more expansive, and also potentially more flexible and responsive. Now, LSD was the breakthrough. There's a picture of Albert on his 100th birthday sitting in his chalet overlooking Lake Geneva. I think that's artificial colouring, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but remarkable, he managed to live to 100. And uh, it's not unknown for some of the great pioneers of LSD research to live to a great age. Uh, and I want to just mention this one, Joel Elkies. Joel Elkies was a, a psychiatrist who escaped from the Nazis in the Baltic regions uh, before the war. He came to Britain, and he set up in Birmingham University uh, the Experimental Psychiatry Unit. It was the first, he was the first professor of experimental psychiatry in the world. And, uh, and people like me, and I mentioned Guy Goodwin, who came in uh, at the beginning, we're in many ways disciples of Joel because we're experimental psychiatrists. And uh, Joel moved away to the States and, in, in fact, founded the major college of experimental psychiatry, which is called the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, or the ACMP. But I'm sharing this with you now because Joel lived to 101, and he was the first person in Britain to take LST. And he did it as part of a research group that was funded by the Medical Research Council in Birmingham University. And there were three individuals who pioneered this research. There's Joel Elkies, there's Philip Bradley, and in the middle there was Brian Key. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of Brian Key, but I did find a picture of his wife. <laughs> and that is Thelma Lovick, and she is here tonight. And uh, I'm really grateful that you could make it, Thelma, because uh, you're, in a way, the last link to that uh, powerful group of people working in this field in the 1950s in Birmingham. And it was quite remarkable what they concluded from their research. So we're looking at 1954 now, and they wrote that LSD-25 was acting on serotonin-mediated receptor and exerting a selective inhibitory role on the organization of sensory information and the serial organization of information in time. And they were dead right. The only thing that they couldn't tell us was where in the brain it worked. But they'd actually worked it out even that long ago. And because LSD was such a profoundly mind-changing drug, many psychiatrists in the US and in Europe started to study it. And before it was made illegal, there were 1,000 clinical papers. 40,000 patients had been studied. There were 40 books, six international conferences. And pulling it all together, Masters and Houston came to the conclusion in 1971, looking back on that period, results were overwhelmingly positive, describing safe and effective treatments. And they concluded that treatment with LSD is not without acute adverse reactions. But given adequate psychiatric supervision and proper conditions for its administration, the incidence of such reactions is not great. So we had, we thought, I think at the time, we had something that was going to transform uh, psychiatric practice, or at least improve elements of it. And one aspect that is generally not known, what I want to share with you today, is the way LSD was, uh, had a powerful influence on the founding and the development of Alcoholics Anonymous. So this man, Bill Wilson, was the founder of AA. And he had a, a trip when he was being treated for his 
delirium tremens with atropine, something we would never do today because it's too dangerous. But uh, he was given atropine while he was in withdrawal. And, uh, and he had an experience, which I'll share with you on the next slide. But from that experience, Bill realised that to overcome a disorder as uh, powerfully controlling as alcoholism, people had to experience a change in the way they thought. And he believed that LSD could allow alcoholics to do that. And in fact, he, he championed the value of LSD as a treatment for alcoholism. This is Bill's psychedelic experience. Suddenly the room lit up with a great white light. I was caught up in an ecstasy which there are no words to describe. It seemed to me in my mind's eye that I was on a mountain and a wind, not of air, but of spirit was blowing. And then it burst upon me that I was a free man. And he was free from the enslavement of his alcohol dependence. And he wanted others to experience that freedom. And as I say, took LSD and encouraged the trials of LSD in alcoholism. And he was right. Before the drug was made illegal, there were six trials conducted in the USA. And they've recently been subject to a meta-analysis using modern statistical techniques by these two Norwegians. And they came to the conclusion that LSD had an effect size in the treatment of alcoholism at least as great as anything we have today. And when you think that being alcohol dependent takes about 15 years off your life, and we have, in reality, very few treatments, that, that we have no treatment which cures everyone. In fact, the, the success rates of modern treatments for alcoholism probably get less than a quarter well. You wonder why has this drug been denied the millions of people who suffer from this disorder? And the banning of LSD effectively stopped research. From 1967 until two years ago, there were no studies. There were, of course, individuals who believed in psychedelic therapy, who did it in an underground fashion, the most famous and successful of which was Stan Groff. And as a result of his therapies, he came to this conclusion. Psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope is for astronomy. And of course, that was a clinical insight from many hundreds of people he'd treated. But at that time, he didn't know how they worked. And what we've shown you today is that we now have good insights into the changes in the brain which may underpin these therapeutic benefits. And I want to also reflect on these two individuals. These are the two most important Nobel Prizes ever in medicine and physiology. In fact, that picture on the left is downstairs. When you leave the toilets tonight, you will see that man on the wall. That is Francis Crick. And Francis Crick was a biochemist at Cambridge. Uh, and there's a pic that image downstairs. And that image there is him pointing out the structure of DNA. And Crick was a remarkably clever man. Having sorted out DNA, he then went on to help Sanger get the Nobel Prize for de how proteins were synthesized. And then he thought, well, I've sorted out life. <laughs> What's the next challenge? And probably because he started taking LSD, he decided the next challenge was consciousness. Unfortunately, as he's, in 1967, when the drug was made illegal, he was approached by the police in Cambridge who had heard of his rather entertaining parties and they told him if he continued to use psychedelics, he would be arrested. And with his characteristic decisiveness, he said, well, sod the UK, and he went to America and he never came back. So we lost, arguably, our greatest scientist of the last century just because people didn't like him using a drug recreationally, although he could probably have argued it was actually for research, but anyway. <laughs> On the right-hand side, we have Kerry Mullis. Kerry Mullis is the man who invented the PCR. The PCR, polymerase chain reaction, underpins all life science research, and it underpins most food detection. The PCR is how you know 
that your hamburger is in fact a horse burger. <laughs> Mullis was trying to find a way of measuring DNA that didn't take years. And he describes under an LSD trip uh, when he was driving his car down a highway in California. I'm not sure the driving was necessary, but anyway, he, <laughs> he describes seeing this DNA molecule, this helix unraveling like a series of serpents in front of him. And he said, I realized that what I had to do was find an enzyme that would do that. And he searched for his enzyme. He found the polymerase enzyme, and he got the Nobel Prize. And he says clearly he would not have got the Nobel Prize if it wasn't for LSD. And I think we can probably take him in his word, because there is this wonderful quote from Einstein, which sums up Mullis' achievement. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And I think most of us would probably argue that Einstein was uh, a rather good problem solver. So why was this drug, which had therapeutic potential and was changing the face of biochemistry, why was it banned? Well, it was banned because of the Vietnam War. It was banned because young American men who were being conscripted to fight in Vietnam were faced with the choice of going to a strange country which was very hot, very sweat wetty, full of mosquitoes, being shot at by people they wouldn't see, fighting a cause they didn't understand, which when they did understand, they realized was even, even more pointless than they'd been told. And they were faced with the choice of doing that or going to San Francisco, taking LSD and listening to the Grateful Dead. And <laughs> a lot of them decided that was the preferable decision. And the flower power movement, which developed in 1960s and particularly coming to a peak in 1967, was such a threat to the way the US managed its internal affairs that the drug had to be blocked. And I think the, the image, the black and white image at the top right, uh, that protest, drop acid, not bombs, I think that probably is something that we should think about even today. I, sort of, I feel that it's, we have probably have much better outcomes in Syria and Libya if our politicians had heeded that message. <laughs> but even in America, you can't just ban a drug because you think it's politically dangerous. You have to find some concerns, some particularly some medical concerns and some harms. And I have to say, whatever you think about our press, the American press in the 60s was way ahead of the sun, because here are the excuses <laughs> they used to ban LSD. Now, these are clearly fictitious. They're clearly fantasy. But unfortunately, the regulations that existed then and are still the same today are such that a government can ban a drug if it feels there are people who are concerned. And the evidence of concern is that a newspaper editor will publish a concern, even if it's a lie. So the drug was banned. And remarkably, it was banned in the face of opposition from the most powerful man in America at the time, Bobby Kennedy, who would have been president if he hadn't been shot. And so this is the Secretary of State arguing with his bureaucrats, the DEA and the CIA, why, if these clinical LSD projects were worthwhile six months ago, why aren't they worthwhile now? We keep on going around and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about my question? He knew that the concerns that were being used to justify banning LSD were false. But even he could not stop the bureaucratic process of banning drugs from going ahead. And I'll just reflect on the fact we are living through something almost the same today with the Psychoactive Substances Act in this country, which is going to ban any substance that works on the brain, whether it's harmless or not. And I would say to you, there's probably never been a worse example of censorship of research since the banning of psychedelics. 
Well, you might disagree, but the only plausible competing ban of any magnitude is the banning of the telescope by the Catholic Church in 1616. And that only applied to Catholic countries, so astronomy continued in Northern Europe, um, but, was, but the writings of Copernicus were banned for about 150 years uh, in, in the Catholic provinces. But the opportunities lost in the last 50 years by banning psychedelics, particularly in the face of the huge expansion of neuroscience research using imaging, must mean that we've lost much more research than was lost by the banning of the telescope. And re regulators will say, the United Nations will say, well, we don't actually ban research. We just control these drugs to stop recreational use. To which I reply, well, there's no evidence that you stop recreational use, but there's really good evidence you stop research. <laughs> this is the data on psilocybin. Psilocybin, magic mushroom juice, was identified in 1958 by Hoffman as a LSD analogue, in fact. And following that, there was a spike of research. Those are the number of publications per year. You see, they reached a peak of nearly 40 publications there in 19, 1968. And then, with all psychedelics, it was made illegal. And you can see research atrophied. Till some years, 1991, there was not a single paper in the world published on psilocybin. Despite the fact you could research it, no one did because no one could actually get money or go through the regulatory hurdles to do the research. Now we're fighting back, and that is the, uh, that's a sign of psilocybin coming back into scientific credibility. And as I've already mentioned, the LSD data is even worse. Before LSD was banned, NIH in America had awarded 140 grants to research LSD. And since it's been banned, it's, they've not awarded one. And if you want to read more about it, here's a, a paper I wrote last year in PLOS Biology, which gives you a, a very brief and thankfully free overview of the, the problem. Please read it and share it. It's truly the most outrageous censorship of research, I believe, ever. So you might say, well, what about the stem cell ban by Bush? Well, that only applied to the US. The UN conventions apply in 197 countries around the world. Well, we've been fighting back. With Amanda and Beckley, we've done what you've seen today. We've done the LSD studies. We've actually done a series of other studies. But it's not been easy. And one of the problems I just want to briefly reflect on is the problem of getting other scientists interested in this because they, many scientists seem to be, have the same views as politicians over these drugs. They, seem, they want to find reasons not to believe. And we had considerable difficulty getting our first papers published. Statements like, it's all just blood flow changes from 5-HT receptors on blood vessels. What do you expect if you mess with the brain with psychedelics? You'd expect a quality scientist to actually have a better criticism than that, wouldn't you? <laughs> and the reason I show these is because they're, they tell you that some people are biased, but also to give me a chance to give you another quote from Aldous Huxley. And this is a really important quote, because this quote is fundamental to the way we do science in this country. Orthodoxy is the diehard of the world of thought. It learns not, neither can it forget. And an awful lot of science, as well as an awful lot of politics, is very orthodox. And we have to break out of that, or those constraints, if we're really going to progress. We now think that our work on psychedelics has actually opened up a different avenue of consciousness research, one which is about meaning, integration, change, rather than simply whether you're awake and attentive or asleep and snoring. And one of them is a 5-HT-mediated form of consciousness, and one is controlled by the amino acids GABA and glutamate. So I think this is a, a very important advance in the whole science of consciousness. And we've already heard, and I'm now showing you the data, that even one LSD trip, with, when you're spending most of your time with your head in a scanner of one sort or another, 
produces changes two weeks later. Those volunteers who were at the beginning relatively optimistic and open became even more so as a result of that single experience. So this uh, suggests that there are or well, there is the potential for these drugs to change the way people think about themselves, even when they're um, probably feeling pretty together generally. And the opportunities in disorders like addiction, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, and particularly, I think, in the short term, in end-of-life anxiety, people coming to terms with dying, are really quite profound. And I'm going to finish with this quote from George Bernard Shaw. Those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And we have seen in the last 50 years the scientific establishment and the governments of the world refusing to change their minds on the lies they've told about the harms and the lack of value of psychedelic drugs. And I think, well, I hope that the research we have done showing that there is a brain substrate which is meaningful both in terms of the subjective experiences and also potentially explanatory of the therapeutic potential will help those people who are uh, not open-minded to change their minds. If you want to go back into history, well, Freud was there before us. Freud said, the future may teach us how to exercise a direct influence by means of particular chemical substances upon the neural apparatus. It may be there are other still undreamt of possibilities of therapy. And I think psychedelics fit well into that prediction. Now, it's 73 years since LSD was synthesized to how we now have shown it works in the brain. And I really hope that we don't have to wait another 73 years for the next breakthrough. And in order to make sure we don't, we need to make three changes. We need to take psychedelic drugs out of Schedule 1, which makes them almost impossible to study. Only four hospitals in this country have a Schedule 1 license. We have to put them alongside that much more dangerous drug called heroin in Schedule 2. We have to accept that psychedelic research is mainstream science. That may be harder to do. And of course, we must increase funding. And those of you who are interested in our research and are rich, please come and see us afterwards. <laughs> so I'm going to stop. I'm going to say thank you. And we now have time for questions. Thank you very much.